Good afternoon, morning, or night, wherever and whenever you are. Uh, if this is your first time joining us, welcome back, or welcome for the first time. If not, welcome back. This is another episode of Text2, the show that discusses the best of everything tech, computers, home theater, science, gaming, UFOs, aliens. Okay, we're exaggerating a little bit there. All those fun topics, though, and more. And I am Mark Murin. And I'm Dylan. And we're back, episode 26, here in 2012. And uh, so how's it going? How's it going over there? I'm doing all right. Doing all right. Excellent. Excellent. And um, I've, uh, I've been rolling out Office 2013. And as I mentioned earlier today, I was not liking the flat interface, the flat appearance that we're used to from Visual... Uh, studio 2012 but that's what microsoft is forcing on us on the plus side i hear link has improved yes you can type and has keep typing and scroll up and scrolling up it's so <laughs> cool organize all your um conversations in one window if you so choose you can also pop them out with oh like can you that's nice i was thinking that like having them all tabbed is interesting but it does seem like that wouldn't actually be that great generally as I use it but so that's cool yeah and um, it does require that you uh, if you've had 2010 installed previously and you install office 2013 you have to uninstall uh, link 2010 to get rid of it otherwise you have two links on one machine and the world does not need two links I think one is enough I think we can agree on that <laughs> yeah that sounds like that would end well huh <laughs> two links are not better than one but uh, We've had some other interesting uh, science fiction news recently. Uh, George Lucas, previous to losing his mind here, where he was saying uh, we were all going to space after, uh, what is it, 12, uh, 21? Yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah, at the end of the world, the mind calendar. It's thing. whatever, it's soon enough. Yeah, he, scale, I guess, right? he was all skittish about his franchise, and he decided to let Mickey Mouse t take over the helm there and... Uh, do some Star Wars. <laughs> so, um, there we go. Yeah, what could so possibly go wrong? There he is in this picture here, holding lightsabers with Mickey Mouse. I think Mickey Mouse is going to be the new um, Padawan, perhaps, learner, and uh, being uh, tutored by um, uh, Luke Skywalker, maybe? I mean, they did pretty much have that uh, foreshadowed at the end of Episode 6, as I recall. <laughs> that, that's true. But Star Wars 7, 8, and 9, in all seriousness, Disney has bought them for $4.05 billion, I believe was the figure. And now we have Star Wars episodes 7, 8, and 9, but not the way George Lucas originally intended, although he is going to give some guidance to some of the writers, and one of the writers being uh, the writer from Toy Story 3, I believe, so it could yeah and uh i think little miss sunshine is that recall yeah I, I wasn't sure on that part um but it could be interesting because in a way it's not george lucas this time so if it's sort of like a quote unquote fan movie even though it's not really a fan it's an actual writer it could be better than the last time around with the prequels uh, but uh, I think his yeah. original treatment was to be like Luke Skywalker in his 30s and 40s and the progression of rebuilding the Republic after the, the downfall of Darth Vader and the Emperor. So it'll be interesting to see what, what route they take for 7, 8, and 9 that's going to be different from that. And there are supposed to be cameos of the original Luke Skywalker and you know uh, Mark Hamill and, uh, and company there. I um, seem to recall hearing that they were not going to be sticking with the books. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They're they're going away from that that idea. Well, the, the I don't think the books are really Lucas's, right? Or I suppose I should say they're going away from the extended universe books. I think is what I heard. They're not going to be following those. Yeah, um, I don't know how official that is. I might be. I might have misheard or misremembered that. But an interesting strategy, I guess. Yeah, we'll see what happens. That's in 2015. And uh, hold on one second, I have to adjust something here. Uh, 
I had a laptop running here and uh, forgot to plug it in and I couldn't figure out why it had gone dead. <laughs> so it's plugged in, it has power now and we're uh, on the road to recovery. But at any rate, so um, we got Star Wars coming, 7, 8, and 9. We've got uh, new Prometheus version 2 coming out. I don't know if you had a chance to see that one yet, but that one's coming soon. And um, of course, I finally saw Alien for the first time. Yeah, that's sad that it took me this long to finally get to see Alien. But Prometheus and Alien, same universe, so to speak. Interesting little uh, movies there. Check them out if you haven't seen them. And uh, we're going to uh, get the news stories firing up here in one second. So Prometheus version 2, that's the... That's the second one. I know they're planning three, but it's going to be out soon. I I've not followed that. I'm not sure on the exact date of Prometheus two, oh, okay. <laughs> but it is it is coming. Uh, there's going to be a sequel to Prometheus, which I enjoyed Prometheus without giving any spoilers away. I thought it was a pretty solid movie. Uh, initially had a lot higher ratings, at least on IMDb, but it's it's gone down since it was released to theaters and now on DVD, obviously or Blu-ray. But um, at any rate, uh, let's, uh, let's move on and um, see what's cooking in the tech stew this week. And fire Program up the news. Program complete. Stories. Enter when ready. Well, the big story, of course, recent story here is uh, Steven Sanofsky is out on Microsoft. He has stepped down. He's a longtime Microsoft partner since 1989. He's been trusted with overseeing many of the company's core products, including Office, and most recently, of course, Windows and Windows 8. At one point, he served as former CEO Bill Gates' technical advisor. He built a reputation for delivering products successfully and on time, was given command of the Windows division that was initially in turmoil. Windows Vista was a disaster. And they relied on Sanofsky to turn Windows around and deliver Windows 7 on time. So he was a deliverer, so to speak. And uh, he interviewed with CNN Money. And at the Windows 8 launch event, he dismissed criticism that Windows 8 would be too difficult for consumers to understand. He noted the new start screen gestures are simple enough for Windows to grasp quickly. And he began to tell a story about how he was recently buying a new car picking the same make and model as a reliable 10-year-old car he was trading in, but he said when he got in the new car, he couldn't figure out how to start it up. I sat in the car, and I had no idea where to put the keys, he said, and then I saw a big glowing button that said start, and that's all it took to figure it out. Let's call the old car Car XP and the new one Car 8, he said, smirking. And apparently Balmer and Sanofsky were not agreeing towards the end, and a uh, change was needed. But um, the tale of Steven Sanofsky is quite long. Apparently he was a taskmaster. Master. He was hard to work with, wasn't liked by many of his co-workers and even some of his managers. Uh, when he would write uh, blog articles or news, or other people would write news rather, I should say, if he felt it wasn't worthwhile, th uh, then he... He told them basically what what he said should be the way of, the way it is, and no one else can take any other slants on it. And he would even blacklist journalists for writing about different things he was working on if he didn't like what he was hearing. Of course, he was famous for his his uh, seven thousand word uh, blog posts, and even journalists would get interrogated by him via email. If he didn't respond, apparently, to every point, he would keep at you until you answered him. And he was doing the same thing to co-workers and even managers in his own division. At least these are the, the so-called current rumors and probably truth, too. And hard to work with, divisive, and uh, he's both similar and dissimilar to that of Steve Jobs. Actually, he was more compared to um, Forrestal and the ousting of Forrestal from uh, Apple, Apple. Julie Larson Green is now in place, but she's not officially the president per se of the Windows division, but she was second in command. 
and uh, apparently also he um, his Windows team would reject any technology that wasn't invented by their team. They would re-implement things in their own way. So one example is the Refus replacement for NTFS and he drove Windows client in its own direction and the server folk had to take it or leave it so there was, wasn't very good inner organizational cooperation going on. And the big thinking is that once Windows 8 was released they um, pretty much ousted him and and made made a change because they figured this was the good time to make the change even though he helped get Windows 8 out the door and so on. So said, thank you very much time for a change but uh, it's an interesting little change here for Microsoft. Yeah that's for sure I mean it should be interesting to see what comes out of it um, I mean, it's it's definitely. Uh, I mean, do we know how much he is involved in, what or I should say, was involved in, um, like the whole design of Windows 8 and um, the interface once previously known as Metro and all that sort of stuff. He was pretty much key, I think, throughout all of that, especially removing the start button. That was, I believe, most of his doing, according to most of the stories out there uh, which is interesting to see him go after this is released but I think they want interoperational uh, peace so to speak rather than um, his way or the highway for future yeah. uh, with Microsoft being in turmoil as it as it is to a certain extent yeah I mean it's curious it's it's just curious to me because I mean we have we do see that uh, Visual Studio and Office have adapted the same flat look, and I did not think those were under his in his domain. But well, he's been around since uh, Office 2007, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, well, he's been around for 23 years, but Office 2007 was one of one of his uh, one of his, one of his areas too. But, gotcha. Uh, second, he was a technical advisor to. Um, to Bill Gates at one point too, and believed to probably be the next CEO of Microsoft, and uh, all that has changed. In fact, there was a story about how he helped to set up a new office—not uh, office. I'm, I'm referring to the organization of Microsoft, uh, three-tier structure where you'd have a, I guess, a CEO, and then under them would be three people. But this was causing problems because people who had talent were getting ousted from Microsoft and there wasn't room for them, and senior people were getting ousted. But now they've adopted that plan throughout all of Microsoft, so his legacy lives on. I mean, it's not to say that he, he wasn't talented, but uh, hard to work with to a certain extent, and uh, not, very, uh, not very good with the journalists <laughs> as far as cooperation went. Uh, but uh, time for change there at Microsoft, and we'll see what happens here in the near future but moving on here we have maps for iOS we had already heard before um, about the wake of Apple Maps iOS 6 fiasco and Google was plotting its own app, app for iOS to launch before the end of the year and the uh, Wall Street Journal reports that the app is in the polishing stages and would be submitted for approval to Apple if that has, hasn't already happened by the time you're listening to this podcast in fact uh, there's been a test version out there I believe I saw some images online showing uh, like a 45 degree angle down low you could get towards buildings and so forth looked pretty cool um, I really still don't understand why Apple went with their own route there rather than using Google I suppose it was a uh, monetary thing or something like that there was some uh <laughs> there was a story to that unfortunately i don't really recall it because it's not really my scene as it were but um it was something like the license negotiation was going up was expiring and um so they went to renegotiate it and apple and google had different demands and uh basically it fell through i forget what exactly what exactly they were then ended up breaking it apart but uh yeah there was they they weren't just like yeah you know we're done with Google we're gonna do our own thing now there there was a there was were negotiations um, and demands were there and then it fell through so 
Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, of course, Nokia has worked well for um, Windows 8 phones, so yeah, I guess it could have worked out for Apple Maps had they got it right, but uh, not this time. <laughs> uh, moving on to the next story, we have Google Fios is humming along in Kansas at 700 megabits per second. Google Fiber is being installed all over Kansas City right now. People are so happy about the blazing speed they've posted pictures of their speed tests. It's insane. Uh, people with Google Fiber can expect 700 down and about uh, on Ethernet and 200 down on Wi-Fi. And that is just incredible. According to uh, Mike Damaris, founder of 3D, told Ars Technica, we just got it today and I've been stuck in front of my laptop for the last few hours and it's unbelievable. I'm probably not going to leave the house. Uh, so um, Google Fiber humming along there in uh, Kansas City, but a long way from our neck of the woods, I suppose, for right now. It's pretty impressive speeds. Compare that to our 50 megabit download, or 100, about seven times the speed, at least. And now we have an ad. This text to you podcast is sponsored by Cadillac. No, it's not really sponsored by Cadillac. We're talking about built-in ads that are hidden in Windows 8, just lurking beneath the surface. Ads can be found inside of some of the modern UI apps. Okay, they're called Metro. Let's, uh, let's not use that word. I don't like that word. Inside the Metro apps <laughs> that Windows ships with, that includes finance, weather, travel, news, and so forth. So, um... The uh, modern UI interface on Windows 8 delivers a mobile experience on whatever device it's being used on, be it a desktop, notebook, tablet, phone, whatever. On previous mobile platforms such as iOS and Android, seeing ads inside of free apps hadn't been uncommon, but this is where the difference is here. No one expects the ads in a piece of software that just paid good money for, in this case Windows 8. One should point out, though, that these apps, such as the um, news app, <coughs> excuse me, are um, subsidiary apps, subsidized apps that Microsoft uh, provides for free. So in a way, they're kind of on the fringe, but they've actually started doing this in other places too, beyond the um, Windows 8 and uh, Xbox in a bad way. So I personally... I'm not for them. Uh, although, in using these apps, I, in some cases, didn't even notice that they were there. But what's the real meaning behind them? Is it just to get some more subsidized money from Microsoft, or to just to keep the apps alive? Yeah, or tracking habits, too. Uh, track what you're using. Target your ads. It's sort yeah. of annoying. I, I, exactly. And I mean... Um like so what is the point really uh i mean aren't these isn't it built-in software that comes with it like is windows media player gonna have ads next version or something i would hope not but like that's I what mean, i don't get like why are they can what what makes them subsidized apps is what i don't get i suppose well the news app is provided by um what's the uh, big provider reuters so something about subsidizing the news app in uh, that case so it's kind of like reading a newspaper where you would normally see an ad anyway. So in a way, I can kind of see that. As long as they're not up in your face, I suppose, from the perspective of are they up in your face and annoying, I guess they're not that bad because you can kind of keep scrolling and get away from them <laughs> or you just don't notice them as you're reading along. But nonetheless, in a core operating system, you uh, something provided by the vendor, you really wouldn't expect this. So it's... It's sort of unsettling, especially now that they're on the Xbox, too. Well, the Xbox ads have been tedious for a very long time. Just, uh, I mean, they weren't really app ads, but I mean, you'd turn the console on and it'd be like all ads, and eventually you'd find like, oh yeah, play disc. <laughs> this is true. Um, but... You know, it's just taken to a whole new level. I guess one that we're just going to have to get used to if you're going to use Windows 8. And I know some of us just don't want to use Windows 8 for whatever reason, but um, 
Windows 8, folks, is not that bad. In fact, it's pretty good. <laughs> pretty I always like to not. It's not that bad. I it's mean, not you that can bad. Basically after just you ignore all of the new features. After you get past the seven-hour learning curve, you're okay. No, I'm kidding. There is not a seven-hour learning curve by any stretch of the imagination. It's pretty intuitive, especially uh, if you're already used to using an operating system. It's not that bad. Maybe a one-hour tops, something like that for the average person for a tech person five ten minutes you're going you're done you're good no worries in fact pretty soon you're saying hey this is the best operating system as far as speed goes that i've ever used except for Look all these this. things but i could ignore these things so it's great no 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 it's it's, it's quite all right quite all right don't let the skeptics fool you out there i've been using it now for four months since it was in uh, pre-release it's been it's been a solid experience in fact, I haven't had one blue screen with Windows 8, I don't think, to this point. And it has run solid. 29 days, I think, was my record on not rebooting, too. But uh, in terms of uh, Surface with Windows 8, there's rumors floating about the Internet. You know, my Linux box is currently up for 20 days, and that's only because it's it had to come down for Hurricane Sandy power outage. <laughs> Just, you know saying yeah and saying. how many <laughs> how, how many apps do you get on linux again and how widespread is that um yeah okay anyways um <laughs> you got your fanboys and then you've got your fanboys but that's okay nothing wrong with linux i'm not gonna knock linux it's solid otherwise we'll get 100 emails about why are you knocking linux <laughs> solid and android built around that right yep. um, pretty awesome more on that later but um, let's jump to the Xbox Surface and see what's under the surface. Yeah, I mean, Microsoft. obviously, I do have to say, Linux apparently upstaging Windows 8 on the phones. On Android or? Um, yeah, Android. Uh, it, the, have you heard the uh, Windows 8 phone freezing? Does yeah, I saw, yeah, I saw that. I saw that. But they, that's, could, that could be a Nokia issue, too, as well. Not well, yeah, it's a Microsoft almost... issue. It's almost certainly a Nokia issue, but I do. Th it does seem like there's a few just implementation things that need to be worked out on Windows Phone 8, which is not terribly surprising, um, given that it's new. But yeah, yeah, and um, I just figured I wouldn't miss an opportunity to poke fun. <laughs> it's not Microsoft. It's Nokia, and they put out a pretty good uh, 800 series um, seven phone. Uh, so it's a shame they're having battery and freezing issues, but uh, they'll get it worked out, I'm sure. Because other than that, they were saying the phone was pretty solid, um, most reports I read. But anyways, the Xbox Surface is coming. Microsoft has been secretly working on a 7-inch Xbox Surface tablet, according to a report from The Verge. It's expected to launch before the next version of the Xbox recently dubbed the 720 which by the way current rumors are it's going to have a blu-ray player that's one thing i have heard uh, which is rumored to be coming sometime next year 2013. Uh, the verge said it had confirmed with multiple sources familiar with plans within redmond that the xbox surface will likely include a custom arm processor high bandwidth ram designed specifically for gaming tasks this isn't the first time that this rumor has been around in June before Microsoft re revealed Surface RT and Surface Pro documents supposedly outlining the specifications for a gaming specific Xbox branded Surface was leaked. It revealed a 7 inch screen with 1280 by 720 resolution SD ability card and support for four wireless game controllers and that's the big thing. Support for wireless game controllers which most tablets can't do that. You can get some special add-ons, make them work with controllers or suction cups, but the maybe using existing Xbox 360 controllers, we'll have to see. Sources say that these initial specs are accurate and that it won't run a full version of Windows, but a custom Windows kernel instead. An Xbox tied gaming centric tablet makes sense as the second screens are being integrated into gaming by Microsoft's competitors and with the smart glass feature of um, uh, Windows 8 as well and on Surface tablets. It but is. The, uh, I do have to say it's, it's an interesting thing that they would be doing this just because 
I feel like kind of the appeal of the tablet as a game platform is that it's also a decent web and, you know, kind of very light travel computer. And yeah, the, versus uh, a game console, you know? I just question the external controls. I, I mean, that's cool if you can stand a thing up like a regular Surface and play it like that. But... Would you really want to have to lug around a separate controller just to play on your tablet? I. It'll yeah, make it exactly. more playable, it's but are you going to want to? I mean, compare that with the uh, PlayStation Vita, which is a pretty expensive portable gaming device. I suppose if you were getting an entire Windows operating system that would run Xbox games, then that would be a bonus. But from the sounds of it, it's going to be a custom kernel, probably an RT type thing. So I don't know. I don't. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it seems like you know, if someone's like, "Why design a design a gaming tablet?" I'd be like, "Okay," and I'd stick two joysticks on it, and I install like Windows Eight, and be like, "Look, done." <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. You've got a tablet, and it comes with joysticks, so you can play games on it better. And now you have a tablet that you can play games on for like, you know, thirty, fifty bucks more than a normal tablet. This seems so, like it's going to be. People are going to kind of be like, huh? I don't know. Yeah, I question whether anybody's really going to want to spend money on on this uh, Xbox portable tablet if it won't run most Windows applications. Uh, of course, it could be another RT, like we said, that will eventually have you know a lot of uh, Windows applications. But off the start here, not so much. Of course, we're talking mid next year, probably. I'm guessing, but uh, just a guess. Either way, it brings Microsoft uh, Xbox to the tablet, which is cool. I'd like to see it on a regular PC, too. That would be... But then again, why would you want to buy an Xbox if you can get it on the PC? You would just assume play it right on the PC, most likely, as long as it played the same. It is kind of an interesting question, though. I mean, you see with, like, Valve um, doing all their Linux stuff now, which... Uh, I don't think we've talked about, but they, I believe they're now in, in uh, private beta on that. Um, like, it makes me wonder if Microsoft isn't trying to push the Xbox and lockdown devices as their main gaming platform and kind of try to sideline Windows as a platform for gaming. It would be extremely weird, but, like, I don't know, some of their strategies recently have been pretty weird, so... You know, it makes me wonder if they're not trying to, like, now that they see that certain holds are are falling down, trying to, um, you know, reestablish a certain dominance by the Xbox, you know. Yeah, and if you can run a smart glass app on this tablet, you get the best of both worlds. You get the gaming, and you can probably hit a button and switch it right over to your Xbox in one push of the button. But that's supposed to work on a regular tablet anyway. Of course, you wouldn't be able to play the game on your tablet unless you were using the little controller interface that appears. You can control the game using your tablet right now as it stands or in the near future if they haven't updated that yet. So it's, uh, it's the one thing Microsoft, people thought Xbox would be a failure, and it's been a success. So, you know, we'll have to see. see I would say here. for the record, I believe that the amount of money made on it's been pretty small. Yeah, if, especially if, initially. If they've <laughs> even actually made any money on it overall. Um, I mean, clearly it's a pretty successful platform in terms of popularity, but I don't believe it's been a big money maker for Microsoft. They used to take a hit on every Xbox they sold. I'm not sure if that's still the case or not, but it has been a success. I heard there were $220 million worth of uh, Halo 4 something around that that figure uh, on the initial release for Halo 4 so doing pretty well there related to surface apparently their um, California lawyer is suing Microsoft claiming the surface tablet he bought doesn't have all the storage space the company advertised he bought a surface with 32 gigs of storage and ran out of space <laughs> He discovered a significant portion of that was being used by the operating system and apps. Only 16 was available for him to use. Now he's gone on and they're hey, Microsoft saying, hey, it's in the advertisements and <laughs> excuse me. <coughs> and uh, 
I've had the whooping cough here for a while, so it's uh, still lingering on. That's why we're delayed on this podcast. But uh, So his lawyers are saying that, um, let's see, his lawyers filed suit alleging false advertising, and, and uh, the suit aims to change how Microsoft advertises its device and hopes, hopes to force the company to give back revenue and profits that resulted from the alleged wrongful conduct. And, of course, Microsoft saying it's without merit. Customers understand the operating system and pre-installed applications reside on the internal storage, thereby reducing the free space. But let's just compare for a second to the iPad. Uh, Microsoft feels that a 499 32-gig Surface RT is about twice the value you'll get when you buy a 16-gig iPad of the same price. It has 14-gig of free space just by comparison so pretty uh i don't know wasteful on microsoft's part (laughs) wasteful on microsoft's part you think they would have increased that size so that it would have had 32 gigs of free space and they hide it in their fine print of course they make you search and dig for it specifically um according to sokolowski's um sokol how do you pronounce his last name sokolowski is his last name um so i don't know sort of a meh topic but interesting nonetheless i think it's definitely worth telling people about because i mean i think that it's like it, it i mean it's using a really pretty large portion of the storage space um you know i mean like you, when you see uh when you see like an android tablet with like 16 gigs you get it and you're like okay fine all right it actually only has like 14 gigs available to me yeah exactly so but this, this, this is, is like a... half <laughs> <laughs> we're not talking about you know like 27 we're talking about 16 down from 32 uh, i don't know it's uh kind of crappy by microsoft and yes we should put this disclaimer out there in case people have not read the fine print as we have stated if you're buying the 32 big 32 gigabyte rt tablet you are only getting 16 of free space compare that to the ipad 16 gig which has 14 point something in free space 14.3 so there you have it be aware of this as you spend your good hard-earned money on an rt tablet which probably i don't know if this applies to the pro or not as well i would think it would i would expect it would more actually that's what shocked me about it is like all right, on the Pro where you've got Windows proper, fair enough, right? We all know that Windows installs are like that big. Bloated and big. I think yeah. Windows 7 64-bit was like 16 gigabytes. And I think the x86 was like 12 or something, just off the top of my head. So, I mean, they I think they've gotten the size kind of down a little bit, but like... For Windows RT, where they don't have any of the Win32 or any of the compatibility, it's like, or at least they're not supposed to, it really does surprise me that there's that much storage space in you in use. Like, I mean, I, I think under Windows 7, the bulk of it was in the uh, side-by-side assemblies, and I don't really see why WinRT would have those. I think it's just one of those things where you can just have to figure that Windows 8 was pretty rushed internally to hit the tablet market. Yeah, it's uh, interesting, though, <laughs> just so everybody is aware on that. And um, we should um, <clears throat> roll on to the next topic, and that is of um, uh, that is of Google and Dish Network allegedly are in talks for a new wireless service. According to the Wall Street Journal, Dish is in preliminary talks with several companies, including Google, to partner up on a new wireless service that would rival Verizon and AT&T and others. Uh, that's hot on the hills of the fiber optic internet services in Kansas. And um, it has limited wireless options in a market saturated by the big four telecom companies. The search giant must gain more access to wireless spectrum so it can increase web traffic speeds in a push to get users to integrate more fully with the Google ecosystem and become part of the collective. <laughs> Dish Network, on the other hand, is awaiting FCC approval to use its spectrum to launch a wireless service that would work in conjunction with its satellite TV service. So it's possible that the two companies would join forces for each other's benefit, Google having the edge in the market by gaining well-established provider like Dish Network, 
and Dish Network gets all the millions of people who love Google products. So uh, that's definitely an interesting development coming our way very soon, if it pans out. Yeah, I'm curious how well that will work. I seem to recall. I mean, there are um, definitely satellite internet providers, but I think that's really going to be probably limited to um, just people who can't get broadband otherwise. Like those other ones tend to be um, just because the lag apparently is pretty bad. And, you know, necessarily you're docking the space and then back to Earth. It, yeah, the, the satellite internet is pretty terrible. I forget what the up average download speed is something in the, I don't know, 400K range. I could be off on that. At least it was a, a while back when I used to Yeah, I seem that. to recall that the download might not be that bad, but the upload's bad. I think this may be what it is. It probably would be on Dish, I would think, just because it's, you know, so focused on delivering stuff down. Um, but, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how, the tur- how it turns out. But I, I don't really think that it's going to be viable for anyone that can get normal broadband. Sure. Yeah, but uh, we're going to move on to the other topic, and this is a recent uh, news headliner here, that uh, Microsoft Server um, 2012 Essentials was released recently and um, we're comparing this here for this discussion point as um, let me find the right picture here there we go Uh, Windows Home Server 2011 and we previously had small business server essentials they um, lost my train of thought sorry Uh, my spot rather I should say Uh, They offer a host of services for those with multi-PC environments, including centralized image-based backups for each PC. And that's why people like Home Server in particular. And I believe in the past, Home Server hasn't required a domain. Now, of course, with Server 2012 Essentials, it requires the server portion to install a domain, but not the client. More on that in a second. And you can use the backups made with your home server if you have multiple PCs for restoring files, folders, and entire PC images. Essentials adds a push forward to newer technologies such as the PC refresh and PC restore features as well as the file history tool. And with Essentials 2012 you're going to gain some perks like the automatic and centralized file history backup and the ability to run the management interface they call the dashboard in a remote app session with other applications instead of needing to remote to the server. That's one of the cool new things of server 2012, incidentally. These require you to install the connector software on the client PCs. And previously there was a similar connector set up with home server 2011, or WHS as people call it, and it did not require domain configuration as we mentioned. With Essentials you can still get all those features as long as you install the connector software on the client PCs with or without joining to a domain. And this really depends on whether you're using a starter edition, for instance, in this example of Windows 7, or the business version, or Windows 8. The key here to remember with 2012 is that it requires Windows 7 and Windows 8. You don't have to have the business version as long as you don't care about joining to the domain. That's the main key. Now, I did some uh, little comparisons here to show the differences between uh, 2012 server versions. There's a ton of them. (laughs) We've got um, uh, a grid here, which I need to blow this up so I can see it. If you maximize your window, you can pretty much read this pretty clearly, I I believe. Uh, One second here. The biggest difference between Windows Server 2012 Standard and Windows Server 2012 Data Center versus that of Essentials is that they all have the same features, but virtualization is different. If you look at the chart, you'll see what I mean. Uh, Many will wonder whether they should move to Essentials from Home Server 2011. And there's some reasons why you should and probably some why you shouldn't because if everything's working right now why change a good thing but for smaller businesses there's 2012 foundation server now that that limits you to 15 users 
and of course 2012 essentials now essentials is geared towards home offices with no IT department whereas foundation is along the lines of you got the main server version but uh, businesses that have uh, maybe a small IT support essentials will support only 25 users or less it doesn't have the Hyper-V or server core options those are for virtualization most businesses don't need those so it has enough to satisfy most people server 2012 essentials of course has to be windows 7 or higher or mac os x 10.5 to 10.8 and uh, so taking a look at this grid uh, you can see the virtualization for essentials says that you can run a one vm or one physical server but you can't have both you can't have a physical server with hyper-v basically if you have the standard version of 2012 you can have two virtual machines running on that box I don't know I don't think there is a limitation in reality but legally and license wise there is and with data center you have an, you're allowed an unlimited number of virtual machines by licensing terminology here and essentials also differs in terms of the file services only having one <laughs> DFS route and uh, distributed file system and in terms of the network policy 250 connections for RRAS or 50 IAS connections and two IAS server groups you also get 250 remote desktop connections with essentials it's unlimited with standard and data center and you only get 20 with the foundation version so what are you getting with essentials you are getting as Microsoft puts it it enables a dynamic modern work style with access for your devices by using remote web access and take advantage of Windows Phone 8 and Windows Phone 8 devices for a superior experience with rich modern my server apps <laughs> enjoy peace of mind that your data is protected and it also has Windows Azure online backup and the file history feature of course office 365 integration and you have storage spaces and real run-of-the-line business apps that will um, be certified for all of Windows Server 2012 editions so that's the main the main features of Server 2012 Essentials so effectively the key to installing the um, server 2012 essentials on a client machine is that you connect to the server from the browser using http colon backslash or forward slash forward slash um, the server name slash connect and you run the connection wizard put in the credentials and just like a domain connection you do the steps from there on put in the you know, computer description and so forth and then you can um, um, your PC can run the dashboard and launchpad software and do centralized PC backups in the background with the domain method shared folders and media sharing will all work and that this is what the uh, dashboard looks like incidentally in server 2012 essentials so that's the um, the big broad overview of server 2012 essentials pretty cool if you only have 25 users and and um, overall I don't know, I'm pretty excited about 2012 in general for for uh, upgrading our servers at our work soon. Especially ah. the uh, well, the the feature of um, of um, remote access, direct access in particular. It allows you to connect without a VPN if you're running enterprise on your work machine. Oh, I see. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask what the uh, what's up with the remote desktop uh, sessions. Yeah, you can. You okay. you'll be able to connect with the direct access, provided I it, in our work situation this is the case. I have to install a 2012 server that is running the services that provide that access you connect and you can access all the shares on the server without VPNing so on your machine at home you'll be able to just browse slash slash server name slash share as long as you have the direct 
access server running on the domain at, at the work location and you're running enterprise for your Windows 8 machine at work. So those are the two keys of making that work. Interesting. I mean, it's fun, I guess. I don't it'll know. Be, it'll be an interesting thing to play around with, for sure. I, I mean, VPN's got other benefits, too. So I, I, I do wonder what the uh, real benefit here that they're aiming for is. Aside from yeah, I don't know. You still have to jump through a few hoops. So I guess, what do you want to configure a VPN client or do that? Yeah, exactly. I mean, as I recall, configuring the VPN took like two minutes. And then I click on it. Well, I guess our, our VPN is not the greatest VPN in the world, the one we're using right now. Um, I'd prefer we had a hardware VPN, but we haven't been able to acquire that as of yet. Um, maybe one day we will. Yeah, I mean, would that really add much configuration issue? And it seems that, like that would make it really simple. People would hit a website and they could access all the shares and they could install a local client if they wanted to, instead of having to configure a client. It would do everything automatically and prevent you from needing to do so in certain situations too. So it all depends what you want to pay for. Do you want to spend two thousand on a hardware device so everybody can connect, or do you want to install a um? you know, server-based software that'll let you do something similar for a portion of your company. Most people aren't going to be upgrading to Windows 8, so for most it's not really a uh, an option <laughs> at this point. But let's roll on. Science topics. Uh, recently we posted an article about the super earth that was discovered. Potentially habitable super earth. The scientists say they found a new exoplanet planet that might have the right conditions to support life. The planet is called HD 40307G and part of a six planet system. It's located in what's believed to be the habitable zone of the star system. Uh, we should emphasize that they believe it's there. It's a candidate planet, although th they're going to probably confirm this very soon. Um, it's believed to be in the star system and the discovery was made by astronomers led by Miko Tumi at the University of Hertfordshire of Gillam and Galada Esquid of the University of Göttingen. I hope I said all that correctly. It should sure. be noted yeah. that uh, <laughs> this is a candidate planet, as we mentioned. So it was originally believed it was a system surrounding a dwarf star only had three planets, but they dis uh, used techniques to avoid fake signals created by stellar activity and identified three new super-Earth candidates. The dwarf star is considered quiet and old, perfectly capable of ha having planets and harboring life. The star is dimmer, cooler, and smaller than our own solar system. So they pioneered data analysis techniques, including the use of wavelength as a filter to reduce the influence of the activity of the signal from the host star, and that increased their sensitivity and enabled them to reveal the three new super-Earths, and the one in particular in this case. Well, this one orbits the star in 197.8 days. It's thought to be seven times larger than the Earth. Rotates on its own axis, creating day and night effects. And it's a 42 light year journey from Earth. <laughs> one day, direct imaging telescopes may collect more data on this. They're giving it a 50% chance it has a rocky core. And they orbit its eccentric and the average temperature might be around 9C or 48 Fahrenheit and the orbit being eccentric ranges from minus 17 to 52C or 1.4 to 126 Fahrenheit still within range uh, but in terms of the in terms of the um, the size uh, depending on the density of the planet that's the biggest key it could have the same surface gravity as the earth meaning if you stood there you'd weigh the same as here on earth so um, yet another one discovered out there. Recently we found the one around Alpha Centauri, which is pretty exciting, only 4.2 light years away. Incidentally, if you were to travel 4.2 light years at 99% the speed of light, it would take 44 months of your life to get there and return as eight and a half to nine years went by in the journey, just as a relativistic experiment there some cool stats I dug up on going to Alpha Centauri. Now if this one's 42 light years away we could do the math on that but I'm not going to bother right now but you get the idea. As you're traveling faster close to the speed of light time moves more slowly from a relative's perspective 
relative perspective and everyone on else ev for everyone else on earth time moves along at the normal rate but for you it's very very slowed up and everybody gets older so as well i'd say more like a very very slightly slowed up i mean realistically if you're talking about accelerating a mass the size of a spaceship to relativistic velocities the amount of energy required would be ridiculous well yeah so, yeah no, i'm talking from a statistical standpoint this yes. was uh, was a topic on several uh, articles out there and uh, worth checking out but of course yeah we're nowhere near 99 percent heck yeah, exactly. we it's more like one percent will be about 99 percent the same yeah <laughs> but um Interesting stuff. Yeah. So uh, moving on to another topic here, and that is of the uh, China is a pen, uh, potentially uh, working on a secret spaceship, uh, space plane, mystery space plane. Uh, the Air Force has the X-37 mini shuttle, and now they're watching the Shenlong in China. A meteor reports from Chinese outlets reported a test flight that apparently included an airdrop from an H-6 bomber, and the nature of the Shenlong Project testing as well as the robot vehicle uh, remains sketchy. And China watchers in the U.S. have taken a stab at what it might mean. A challenge to the U.S., more competition. Shenlong is China's effort to, to develop a re-entering aerodynamic spacecraft similar to the space shuttle or the X-37B, but much smaller than either. And the economic rationale for NASA shuttle was never realized and not clear what the advantages of the X-37B offers the U.S. military over conventional upper stages uh, from some reports. But uh, apparently um, there's enough here that the Shenlong may also be a little bit more than a symbol of China's ability to challenge the U.S. assumptions of primacy and technological dominance as well. But uh, all in all, it's going to mean more competition between the uh, U.S. and China, if anything. But the um, interesting story here, at least I thought, I don't know if you've had a chance to ponder this one, uh, Dylan, but this is uh, quite a, a brain twister. i try to dumb this down as best as possible. But um, basically, <laughs> louder light could provide better quantum um, computing, basically. All the light we see around us comes in chunks of energy known as photons, as well as making up light photons can be used to carry and process information. And their quantum properties make possible new tasks in secure communication, ultra-fast quantum computing, and so on. So to develop these new technologies, they scientists have to learn to manipulate single photon quantum states, which is a tricky thing and collaborators at the University of Queensland and the University of Science and Technology in China, research group at Griffith University, have done that. They have experimentally demonstrated the noiseless amp that the noiseless amplification of information encoded in one photon, a single photon, that has been subject subjected to loss, and the results were published in the Nature Physics on uh, recently. So the question here is, what are we talking about? <laughs> Amplifiers are ubiquitous in modern technology. They're used to enlarge singers' voices at concerts to boost long-distance data transmission for the Internet, for instance. And modern amplifiers work uh, pretty much just work, and signals come through crystal clear nearly all the time. But now we're talking about quantum noise. That's uh, so much smaller that the signal being amplified that it can't be completely ignored unless the signal is a quantum system itself. So here we have quantum communication. Scientists have been working on the development of quantum tech, devices that will use fundamental properties of the very small quantum world to outperform the best classical technologies. Um, encoding information into the quantum states is one of those using properties that they call polarization. Information transmission and processing with photons had the potential to guarantee secure communications and the ability to calculate solutions uh, to certain problems that can't be practically solved by ordinary computers now or ever. But um, for the data to be secure, each quantum bit that is called a qubit of information is typically sent in a single photon. But here's where the tricky part is, that Heisenberg's uncertainty principle means that if you eavesdrop on it and try to 
read the information, you disturb the photon, and the quantum version uh, changes, basically. You can't have your cake and eat it too. And the point is that the intended recipient can detect the intrusion or proceed with certainty if none exists. Um, but the, uh, the, the range of quantum communication is limited by this loss of photons. So what they've done is they've gone and they've made a photon amplifier. It amplifies the likelihood of a photon being present without learning any of the information carried in the photon's quantum state. So that is sh the famous Schrodinger's cat thought experiment, where the hypothetical cat is in the box because of, hypo uh, because of quantum physics, both alive and dead at the same time. So they have perhaps outwitted that thinking, at least, to a certain extent. Uh, apparently the uh, quality of the information can be preserved to a high degree. It's possible to amplify close to 100% photon present presence, but this actually requires improvements in the quality of the sources of mm -hmm. extra photons. So they're calling them qubit amplifiers, and I thought that was very interesting, especially related to the famous Schrodinger's cat thought experiment possibly changing the way we think about quantum uh, mechanics and the quantum realm and quantum computing. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely an interesting story. I, I do have to look into it a bit more. Very complicated. If you want the yeah. full read, just look up amplified louder light in quantum and you'll you'll see exactly what I mean. But the um, the ramifications of this are pretty pretty large. It even gets into um, tele teleporting uh, quantum particles and so forth, but um, not like you would think in terms of Star Trek. You're not going to clone. A qubit amplifier can't work every time. Sometimes it tries to teleport the information, but it fails. So you end up with a mangled Captain Kirk mm -hmm. every once in a while. <laughs> uh, this is the interesting story, and I hope you've seen this. If not, here it comes. A UFO was filmed over Denver. Apparently this one person filmed it and appears regularly to him. And TV crews then confirmed it. And I'm going to let the thing play. It's not that long. And there is audio because it's a news story. And it is rather interesting. Even the um, skeptics couldn't figure it out. And here it is. It's not a bird. Keep going up and up and up. It's not a plane. Here it's flipping around. Even this aviation expert is mystified. Um, uh, I can't identify it. We first learned about these strange sightings when this metro area man, who does not want to be identified, brought us his home video. You're going to see a little burst of fire right there, kind of a thruster. He captured the images on his digital camera from a hilltop in Federal Heights, looking south towards downtown Denver. Mile high is right about... He says the flying objects appear around noon or 1 p.m. at least a couple of times a week. You're going to see it come in from the top, do a little loopy doop. The strangest part is they are flying too fast to see with the naked eye. This is the video in real time. Oof, see it? That was it. But if you slow it down frame by frame, it's there. We altered the color contrast to help you see it. Here's another one in real time. This is what it looks like slowed down. We wanted to verify that the video we saw was legit. So our photojournalist came out here with his camera. He set up in the same spot on 84th and Federal and he shot video from just before noon until just after one. And when we slowed down our photographer's video, we saw this flying object. I would consider myself an expert. Aviation expert Steve Cowell is a former commercial pilot, instructor, and FAA accident prevention counselor. It's very strange. He thought he would have a logical explanation until he watched the video. That is not an airplane. That is not a helicopter. Those are not birds. Um, I can't identify it. Cowell told us he knows of no aircraft that flies as fast. Because of the speed of the object, most people, I think, would miss it. Cowell did say there is one other possibility. Perhaps there's some sort of debris that's being raised up by some of the atmospheric winds. But in his professional opinion... As it fits the definition, 
It's an unidentified flying object. The FAA tracks all air traffic in Colorado and across the country. The FAA sent us a statement saying, we've checked with air traffic control and no one has had any reports of the activity you describe, nor have any of our employees observed anything of this nature, either visually or on their radar displays. The North American Aerospace Defense. So pretty much uh, everybody denied that the uh, object exists. They move so quickly you have to slow the video down to even see them, as you can see in that video. But um, no one can really explain them. They even look like they have miniature thrusters on the objects as well. And uh, pretty perplexing UFO video, one of the best I've seen recently. But we're going to just move on to a real, moving on to the flight stew. And we have, um, of course, the uh, the Boeing 787 has arrived in service on d U.S. domestic routes following its first international landing on American soil back in April. And the state-of-the-art aircraft landed at Chicago O'Hare's airport after a flight from Houston operated by United Airlines. It landed 15 minutes ahead of schedule to uh, an ovation of passengers and crew. United has ordered 50 of them, which have uh, two have been shipped so far. And they will take on routes in Cleveland, Denver, Los Angeles, Newark, San Francisco, and Washington. If you're interested in uh, seeing the aircraft's interior, uh, United has a, a tour on the website. It gives you a better look at the interior and those electronically dimmable windows that are kind of cool. Uh, the... Um, Flight Sim topic for the week is that Rex Essential Plus has been released and Overdrive. Rex Game Studios has released their updated photorealistic high def weather and texture package with flight planning ability for FSX and Prepare 3D. Overdrive includes 14 gigs of textures, real world and random weather generation, built in flight aware, flight planning, environmental and weather related sounds. The Overdrive package is free if you already own Rex Essential. If you're a first-time buyer, it's about 45 to get both combined in one. I have both, and it's pretty sweet. The upgrade installer you can get through the Rex support forums, which you have to become a verified member to get at it. And so what are you getting with uh, Rex Essential Plus? Well, they've added a new process for downloading archived weather from their Rex Edge data servers. They've added new Synoptic and... Uh, micro weather station processes for transoceanic flights using real weather lets you experience the effect of weather fronts the weather engine plus the second weather engine mode that utilizes weather themes for injection of weather smoother no impact on frames per second that's the default setting you have a download center database maintenance tool and the flight center to include temperatures aloft and winds aloft from the interface and um, Updated current SID stars, intersection waypoints, and fixes on freezing and slow download. As usual, you, um, you start with the um, quick start where you can use the flight plans, create your own, or use some online flight plans, for instance, and Rex will generate the textures based on that flight plan, like adding cumulonimbus clouds if you have weather and so forth, uh, or create your own, which is what I usually do. but starting to get intrigued by the flight plan option where it will on the fly generate the textures and just a quick glance at some of the settings here I think I'll have a separate video on this outlining some of the details coming soon on on the website this is the options area similar to before 4096 textures be sure to set your FSX config to 4096 for texture mat max load to match that if you're able to run that requires a pretty intense machine. They've added the new WX Plus interface on the Configuration Manager page. And uh, <coughs> some of the various options have changed here for clouds and winds. They've added some new features. FlightAware incidentally is $1.99 a month if you want to actually use real flight aware planning software and um, you can also go on and browse the Rex Community Flight Center and choose pre-made flight plans. Bring up the weather, for instance here at K-Pit, and so on. So that's, that's Rex. Rex is awesome. 
it's uh, definitely worth the money if you're a flight sim person. And the um, picks in tip of the week are up here. Of course, the one I got to mention here that we started to mention at the beginning of the show is Link 2013. Now, if you buy server, you need to buy a Link server, that is. You should get volume licensing because it is part of the volume licensing site. You can download the standalone Link 2013 client. Or you can install the client that's part of the 2013 professional. If every machine is going to have professional on it, you get it by default. And the third option is you can install the basic 2013 client that is found on the Microsoft site. Um, And they have both the 64 and 32 bit. There um, um, is also a fourth option too of using a down level client as Link Server 2013 is backward compatible with Link 2010 and OCS 2007 R2 clients. That's a Link tip. Now for the exciting Nabby. If you don't know what Nabby is, it's an Android tablet and uh, it's exciting because Android is great. Linux is great. That's, those are true statements. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to have a video and a review on the video or on the website as soon as this podcast hits live. I've already got it ready to go, so this is the video playing here in the background. But um, let's go back to this screen here. The uh, Nabi 2 tablet is a kid-safe tablet that you can get for about $1.99, and incidentally. This Friday, Black Friday, you can get it for one twenty nine at Walmart if you're one of the first lucky people in the door that don't get trampled. <laughs> and it's a 7-inch capacitive multi-touch display. That means you can use a capacitive stylus, which I have for the iPhone. Uh, it has the Integra 3 quad-core uh, CPU, 8 gig of internal, expandable to 32 gig on the micro SD, 2 gigs of free cloud storage, a gig of memory, 2 megapixel front facing, no rear camera, 720p video, battery is pretty okay, it could be better for a tablet, but hey, what do you expect? Uh, size, just about right, 8.69 inches wide, 605 inches high, 114 inches deep, and about 1.31 pounds, feels great in the hands, rubber uh, protection for your kids so they don't drop it, of course they drop it from 50 feet, you're screwed anyway, but hey. It's always good to have that protection around the outer edge of the uh, device. Has 802.11 BGN, Bluetooth 3.0. Has a mini HDMI out. Charges from the DC adapter. And uh, the biggest thing, like I said, is the kids' kids interface, which is pretty slick. You can com- control exactly what the kids can see. Built-in filters already set, like websites, YouTube, and so forth. And you can give them awards for doing certain chores or certain tasks on their games plays all the android stuff and when you switch to mommy daddy mode you get the full-blown android interface and it can be rooted look for that article on our site too about how to root it if you feel like voiding your warranty (laughs) and being able to install directly from google play that's the advantage of rooting mainly here you can launch google play and then install apps from it the alternative is you install google play but you can't install apps from it. You can only install books and music. And there are other websites out there that will tell you how to do that part. But we'll include the routing on the site as well. So that's the uh, the Android device. Any thoughts? <laughs> Since it's Android, I thought, wow, there you go. Yeah, um, I mean, the, uh, the one thing that I did find interesting is that there's the kids mode, which is locked down, of course. Um, but still lets you change a lot of the system settings, which I thought was kind of interesting. Like the Wi-Fi, for instance. The Wi-Fi yeah. in particular, yeah. Like the kid would be putting the Wi-Fi back. <laughs> I didn't mention that in the, in the video review, but, you know. It's, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, worth, obvi- it's not really knowing. a security hole. It's just kind of interesting. <laughs> kind uh, of funny in a way, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it seems like kind of a neat device. Um, Especially you know, for 129 If you can get it for 129 it's almost a no-brainer. Well, I mean, I, I think it just depends on what your what your goal is. I, I don't really... I mean, like, it's kind of... If you've got... If your kid's probably 12 or older, you know, it probably just makes sense to get them a normal tablet anyway at that point. Probably. Uh, unless you're concerned about parental controls even then, which I, I probably still would be even at 12 and older. I Maybe 13, 14, I would probably break loose a little bit, but... 
All right, um, fine. 13. <laughs> <laughs> 13. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, but yeah, it's, it's geared um, primarily for 4 to 10. But that's not to say older people and adults <laughs> couldn't use it. So if you've got your 10-year-old yeah. using it and you switch to mommy-daddy mode when they go to bed, and voila, you've got yourself an e-reader, you're playing Angry Birds, or you're running your flight sim app on it. <laughs> yeah. Um, it is definitely – it's definitely a solid offering. But, I mean, I think that you're – you know, you are definitely paying for the kids' mode, um, and the that's the yeah, that's a big selling point because you're not going to get that and the on dirt, an iPad. The little bit more bumpery hardware and stuff. So, um, it's, it's you know, I'm, if you're not planning on using that, you probably should look at like you know a Nexus Seven or something, which you know, uh, or just another one of those decent tablets. Well, even the iPad Mini, um, yeah, exactly. similar price range, but you don't have the kids' safe interface. Yeah, you still have the same amount of apps. Both stores have about 450,000 apps. I'm not exaggerating on that figure. I think that's pretty accurate. But the parental controls, harder to come by on an iPad. That's that's the biggest advantage here. Yeah, if and you don't care about that, then, yeah, it's not for you. <laughs> exactly. But, um, yeah, definitely, definitely a cool product and a good idea. And um, I think it definitely nails a pretty solid price point. And the hardware seems quite, um, quite good, too. You're running... Uh, quite a few of those games without any glitching so yeah they even run better than the iphone 4 i don't have the 4s but i have the 4 so i mean that that's a given i suppose Mm -hmm. (laughs) well when i'm done choking here we'll get to the final topic exactly (laughs) this is a cool one if you play mass effect and i'm late to the game playing mass effect 3 previous mass effects worked fine with um um, your Xbox 360 controller on a PC. I am playing it on a PC because I have 3D glasses and it looks great. And uh, so if you expect to just plug in your Xbox 360 controller, it's not going to happen. You're not going to work right out of the box. You, you need a X-Patter or some sort of third-party uh, profiler to make the Xbox controller work, joy to key, something like that. The best I have found is something called the Pinnacle Game Profiler, and that is what you see here. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I swallowed the controller, as you can tell. But here it is in reality. I have it running here. I have an Xbox 360 controller connected to it, as you can see. And we can go into the Mass Effect profile under Game Profiles. You can edit the configuration. And... Um, you can set all the buttons to have certain commands and so forth. In this case, this is just a demo, so I don't think any of the buttons are actually set here like you would see on my main PC. Um, and um, you can download profiles from people off the internet and compare the profiles until you find the right one that f- fills the most realistic change the settings and the configuration, adjust the sensitivities um, for the analog sticks and so forth pretty powerful overall but it uh, it has worked well for Mass Effect 3 I can't really complain it's not quite as good as having that mouse of course nothing is ever as good as using a mouse and keyboard no comparison of course if you're taking a console port and you're actually enabling the controller to work with it like Mass Effect 2 you don't really notice that but in this case if you've used the keyboard and mouse you are going to notice a little bit of a difference but if you're sitting on a couch with a 61-inch screen, you'll be thankful to have something like this because it's not not as great to have a mouse and keyboard in a living room situation. So that is the Pinnacle Gamer or Game Profile. You have a trial version for 30 days, and you can pick up the full version. And um, the full version, I believe, is uh, something in the neighborhood of... 15 or 20 dollars something like that it's not that's uh that's all we got for this week's show that's gonna wrap up today's show and remember to keep on cooking with tech and we will see you next time on text do next time